Hi, everybody. Don't you wish you were on Seba? We're streaming live from Lambie's Place on the island of Seba with Shea Booba as our host, and we'll be ready in just about two minutes. Thanks for coming in. Waiting for my cue. Hi, everybody. You can hear me? Hi, everybody. Taking my cue from Adam. Hi, everybody. Ooh, there we go. Welcome to the second night of See and Learn 2022. We are ready to start. So as some of you know, that begins with a click. That lovely video was created by Chizzy Lala Productions, and that's Adam, who is how we live stream. Uh, so welcome, everyone, this evening, and welcome to our international audience. We are live streaming from Lambie's Place on the island of Saba with our hosts, Duco, Claire, Shea Buba Bistro. So let's hear it for our sponsors. We have to go through a few things before we get started tonight. So that was our sponsors. Prince Bernard Culture Funds has been sponsoring us and making this event possible for years, as is public entity SABA, the government of SABA. Uh, thank you very much. 
Our uh, speaker tonight is sponsored by Solera Dunia, a beautiful boutique hotel located on the level in Seba. And, whoops, what are we doing? Thank you. And we would like a round of applause for all of our sponsors. You can see there are over 50. <laughs> Many of them are in our audience. Uh, there's all kinds of ways to support See and Learn as a business, as an individual. As an individual, you can write us a review. You can support a sponsor and say, hey, I really appreciate it. I'm giving my business to you because you are a sponsor. And uh, you can buy a raffle ticket, and we have great prizes. As you can see, Emily's in the back, and Alexis. Tickets are only $5, great prizes. Let's talk about some upcoming events uh, that we have going on. So tomorrow, we still have space on the dive with our presenter tonight. And once you watch his presentation, hopefully you're going to be like, OK, sign me up. So uh, during the introduction, we'll tell you more about what he's doing. And certainly during his presentation, he will tell us uh, what to expect tomorrow on the field project dive. You do need to be a diver. Uh, the following, on Wednesday night, we will be down at the Fort Bay with a beautiful uh, scene of the ocean at the new restaurant on Saba called Ocean Club. So uh, as part of our organization, we provide free transport when it's places like that. But you do have to register at the tent and tell us that you need a taxi and meet us at that one meeting point. It's very important that we know how many people so we know how many taxis to arrange. Uh, I lost my slide. <laughs> Uh, Wednesday, sorry, and then our next field project dive will be with Dr. Allison Robertson. She here? Oh, there she is. Give us a wave, Allison. So we have a, another dive that you can join, and again, you must register at the tent and uh, do some paperwork, but make sure you join these. This is your chance to be a marine biologist do some citizen science work, and maybe even make a contribution to science. OK? Uh, one more time, our live streaming is possible thanks to Carib Trans. Carib Trans is a freight company. So when you live on a five square mile island, it's real important. How do we get our Amazon packages? <laughs> so uh, again, a great sponsor. And that's how we do our live streaming. So thank you very much for that. So we're going to really get started. Excuse me. Okay, tonight we have Dr. Chansey McDonald here with us. He's originally from New Zealand, so if you are trying to distinguish the accent, and he's going to speak in depth, a little pun there, about mesophotic coral reefs and how depth influences ecological relationships among reef fish. As you dive down from sunlit surface waters to the darker, cooler depths of mesophotic coral reefs, many things change. Dr. Chansey McDonald studies multiple facets of reef fish ecology to better understand which fish live at mesophotic depths and how their lives change along these steep gradients. Chansey was recently a postdoctoral researcher at California Academy of Sciences, a great supporter of Sea and Learn, by the way, where he trained in closed circuit rebreather diving with field sites in the Maldives, Roatan, Honduras, uh, he's also worked as a technical officer in the management of crown of thorns starfish on the Great Barrier Reef, of course, in Australia. So let's all go off the deep end with Chansey McDonald. <laughs> Woo! Thank you very much. Hey, everyone, can you hear me all right? Yeah, yeah cool. There's that accent. <laughs> I'll just make sure that the slides are working. Oh, there's one more video. So thanks to the sponsors of Carib Trans for Complete Cargo Solutions that are connecting the Caribbean to the Americas for some time. Miami is known as an international community and the hub of trade and logistics for the Caribbean and Americas. A leader in the freight logistics oh. industry, Carib Trans has served the Caribbean right. region. For Let's just skip. All right. Oh, we love you. Look at this beautiful fish. That's a beautiful fish, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to talk about that one just very briefly a little bit later on. So tonight I'm here to talk to you about the lives of coral reef fish on deep coral reefs, yeah? But uh, I'm not going to start with coral reefs. Uh-oh. All right. 
um, because to understand the lives of fish on deep coral reefs, it's really important to understand environmental gradients. So what I want to use is an example that you're all quite familiar with, at least visually. And so what we've got here is a, a, a gradient in plant community. It's, this is from Ecuador, actually. So it's on the equator. And when you're down at sea level, you've got these uh, very warm, very moist tropical rainforests with big leaves. And as you move further and further up the mountain, it gets drier and drier. Um, it gets colder and colder, conditions get harsher, and the type of life get, that can live up there changes. So you get cloud forests, you get wet and dry grasslands, you get ice plants with tiny little leaves that are protecting themselves from freezing, until eventually you get to a place along that environmental gradient where no plants can live unless you take a microscope up there and then you might be able to find a couple. Right, so another environmental gradient that you're also very familiar with is this latitudinal gradient in temperature. Obviously, we're in the tropics, it's very warm, and as you move closer towards the poles, it gets cooler and cooler. And we're all very familiar with this because a lot of people here from Europe or from North America escaping the cooler climates to come down here and spend some time in this tropical paradise. So the reason why it's important to think about these environmental gradients when you're talking about uh, plants and animals and lives in general, but also deep reefs, is that we're having a lot of environmental change, obviously. So as the climate is changing, the places where plants and animals can live along these environmental gradients is also changing. So they're moving in space as the climate changes. And so if we look at our mountain environment again, and we put a couple of frogs on it, they might live down in these lower lands in normal conditions, and if it starts to warm up a little bit, they might be able to deal with that quite okay. But if it warms up too much, the species might want to move along that environmental gradient to find better habitat or places to live. And it might be able to do that a couple of times along the gradient, but at some point, oh yeah, and it might find a refuge. So Is that, yep. Okay, a habitat that is not necessarily ideal for it, but it can still live there. So it's some kind of refuge for that, um, for that frog. But if it tries to move too far along that gradient, it might go too far, right? And then it can't persist anymore, it can't survive. And so this point between a refuge and going too far along an environmental gradient, in this case going up the mountain, is what we call a range limit. And we might expect this range limit to move a little bit as climates are uh, heating up. So basically what I'm trying to say is that um, as environments change, where animals and plants can live along these environmental gradients also changes. And that might be really important on coral reefs. So we were here to talk about coral reefs. And um, one of the strongest environmental gradients on coral reefs is depth, right? So you can see in this picture, um, the light and temperature changes, declines quite a lot, quite rapidly on coral reefs as you move further down the depth gradient. Sorry, love. Um, and so that means that animals and plants that rely on sunlight to um, make their energy also decrease as you move further down those, uh, that environmental gradient of depth. And so corals are one of those animals that relies a lot on sunlight for their energy uh, to survive. And so in the shallow coral reef environments, you get a lot of different types of corals that are really abundant. And as you move further down the environmental gradient of depth, you have fewer corals and fewer types of corals as well. And that's important because the fish that use these corals as habitat and food. Also decrease in abundance and the number of types of fish that you get at, in deeper depths. He's just going to pass up this microphone. Yeah, OK, cool. So basically, if we turn this mountain example upside down and we lay some coral reefs next to it, what we see is kind of three major depth zones in coral reef habitats along the environmental gradient. And so you have this shallow water environment where we have 
bustling life, a lot of corals fighting for space, a lot of fish trying to live up there. And as you get further down the depth gradient, conditions get harsher and harsher until you get to a place where there's not enough light for corals to, to live. Um, oh, this is really annoying. All right. And so, um, so we have this shallow environment, which is kind of from zero to 30 meters or to 100 feet. And we're very familiar with this with recreational diving, yeah? Actually, there's probably a lot of really experienced divers in the audience. How deep have you guys dived? Just a few hands up. 181 meters? Feet. Feet. All right. <laughs> OK. I was like, OK, here you go. <laughs> All right, anyone else up there? 130? Yeah, cool. You guys are starting to get into what we'd call the upper mesophotic zone of coral reefs, yeah? And these are called mesophotic zones because they're mid-light environments. So it's not dark yet, but there's not as much light on the surface, and corals can still persist. So meso means mid, and photic means light. So the mid-light environments. And of course, but we spend most of our time as recreational divers in that shallowest 30 meters, yeah? Um, and even as researchers as well. So the sorts of things that researchers like myself try to understand is where are fish distributed along these environmental gradients of depth, right? So are there some species that are only in the shallowest 30 meters or even the shallowest two meters? And there are other species that live further along that environmental gradient. And what does that mean if we have changing habitats in shallow waters? So for example, with increased water temperatures, uh, corals bleach, they can't keep the algae that uh, feeds them energy from the sunlight anymore, and they die off. And does that mean that some species will die out altogether because they use those shallow environments, whereas other species might persist because they live deeper along the gradient? Or perhaps even some of those fish that live in shallow waters might be able to move down that depth gradient, kind of like our frogs moved up the mountain, and find a great place to live. Or they might be able to live there for a little bit, but because the conditions might not be so good, there might not be enough food, energy, there might not be enough shelter places, they might actually be just ghosts of their former selves. So they might be able to live there for a little bit, but not have enough energy to give, um, uh, have enough babies to keep their population going into the future. And so most of the research that we do that looks at kind of the lives of fish in more detail occurs only in the shallowest 10 meters. Yeah, so we know very little about the way that l fish live further down on this depth gradient. And so the first part of my talk, I'm going to talk about this kind of transition zone between shallow and mesophotic reefs and how that changes the way that fish live. And then the second part of the talk, I'm going to talk about this lower mesophotic zone, which is kind of down to uh, 130, 150 meters, which is really uh, unexplored because it's really hard to get down there. And our team does a bit of work down there. So the first bit of the talk is about the costs and benefits of living at different positions along that environmental gradient. Um, so we talked about how light, temperature, corals and fish all decrease with depth, yeah? And unfortunately, because of uh, changing climates, we're expecting most reefs in every region of the world to bleach every year by the end of this decade, perhaps or at least by the end of 2060, right? So that's pretty full on. And that's really important, right? Because um, it's warm water, and where's the water the warmest? It's in the shallow waters. And so that means that quite often, not always, but quite often, it's the shallow reefs that bleach more than the deep reefs. And so what does this mean? Does this mean that there's potentially increased survival opportunities for fish on the deeper reef? whereas the shallow reef just becomes a ghost of its former self. And so these are the sorts of questions that I've been trying to ask. Now, the first thing you need to understand about the fish living on the shallow reef versus the fish living on the deep reef in order to understand whether this, whether this might be the case is in a, in a healthy reef condition, when there hasn't been any coral bleaching, when there hasn't been a storm event or anything like that, because there's so few fish down at this depth and so few corals, is that because it's just not good habitat for them? And they actually, there's only one or two fish there and they aren't healthy. You know, they can't 
produce enough offspring to keep their population going. So if you lost all of the shallow fish, would these deep fish be enough to keep the, the reef going? And so to use this, uh, I uh, spent quite a few years looking at this particular species, the triangle butterfly fish. And for those of you that were here for the talk on Monday, you'll know that butterfly fish pair up for quite a long time. And these fish do that as well. And the reason why these fish are really good for trying to understand this is because we know a lot about the way that they live on shallow coral reefs. We can follow them around a lot already, and we know um, what they feed on, how far they move, all those sorts of things. So these fish only eat corals, yeah? So the corals have uh, kind of like upside down jellyfish that have polyps that stick up. These corals come along, uh, these fish come along and nip off those polyps, yeah? So that's how they feed. And they're really fussy feeders. So if you imagine each of these dots is a type of coral, they really like to take almost all of their bites from this one particular type of coral called Acropora. And in the Caribbean, um, you have two types of Acropora, Acropora cervicornis and Acropora palmata. So these are the big branching corals that make a lot of habitat structure on the coral reefs. In the Pacific, there's actually quite a lot of Acropora species. So what this pair will do is they'll make a territory around that small patch of Acropora corals and protect it from other fish trying to take over that territory and eat those foods. And they swim around the territory together quite often, um, defending it from other fish trying to intrude. And whilst one's keeping a vigilant eye out, the other one will have its head down and will be feeding on the corals and they kind of take turns. So that way they can protect their territory and also feed on the corals at the same time. So that's what we know from a healthy environment in the shallow coral reefs. So that's kind of a healthy lifestyle. But we know that they also can have an unhealthy lifestyle, even in the shallows. So if you have coral bleaching or a storm event or something like that, and you lose that Acropora coral, that big green one that they really liked eating, what they have to do is they have to expand their territory to take up more space so that they can get the same amount of food because the food just isn't as dense. There's not as many shops in the, in the block anymore, so you have to go six blocks over to get your food. And so what they do is they spend, they still go around their territory, but they spend less time together because they're trying to defend more territorial space from other fish coming in. And that means that they actually f spend less time feeding because they're spending more time defending their territories from other fish. And they actually feed on these other types of corals that quite potentially aren't as nutritious for them. They're not giving them as much energy. And so quite often the fish will actually die, unfortunately, in these environments because they're not getting enough energy. And even when you can still see them on the reef, they're quite often not in good condition. So if you look more closely at the fish, if you look at the amount of uh, energy it puts into its offspring or the amount of energy it stores in reserves for those bad times or just how heavy they are or how big they are, they're not as healthy as those fish that have those really good, healthy resources. And so why that's really interesting when you're trying to think about where the fish on the deep reefs can persist or not, you can kind of use the same setup that we see in, in the shallow coral reef and compare the lives of fish on the deep coral reef to the lives of a healthy fish on the shallow coral reef and see if you're getting that same change. So the way we do this is we tag the fish or we find some marks on the fish that identify that as a unique individual and then we can follow it around. And so it's really fun and then kind of maybe a little bit creepy as well, but I spent like many, many months following these fish around the coral reefs. And you map out their territory and you figure out how big their territory is and what kind of resources are in there, what kind of corals are in there. And once you know where they live, you really can stalk them. You can follow them around and see who they're interacting with, what they're feeding on, how much time they're spending doing each of these activities and kind of try to understand what are the costs of living at, for that fish. And luckily for us, the territories, here's some example of what they look like, are stacked on top of each other. So you can compare the life of a fish in the shallow reef to a life of the fish on the deep reef. And we're talking about kind of zero to two meters down to 40 meters. So that's kind of the depth comparison that we're doing there, just at the very um, boundary of the shallow and the upper mesophotic reefs. 
So what we're looking for is an increase in territory size. You know, we talked about how the increase in territory size means that there's more energy to protect that territory and less time feeding. And so we see that these fish on the deep coral reefs do have larger territories because there's fewer corals there so they're, and they're further apart. So they're having to spread out their territories to get enough food down there. But as you can see, they don't have many neighbors down in the deep depths there, right? So they're not actually having to spend as much time fighting with other fish. And so that means they're not spending as much energy trying to keep their food to themselves. So they actually have a benefit there in that they don't spend as much time defending their territory. Their feeding rates, because there's fewer corals, and also because those corals are deeper and, and they don't have as much light energy, you might expect them to not be as healthy. So you might have to feed more from corals to get the same amount of energy going. But actually, because um, they had these bigger territories and they weren't having to spend their time defending them, they could actually feed just as much. So it's kind of surprising. We thought there'd be lots of costs for these fish on deep, shallow reefs, but it's starting to look as though there's not that many costs for them at all, actually. And they really are fussy, like I said. They like to eat those acroporas. There's fewer of those acroporas down there. But what they managed to do is put their territories on the patches where acroporas are so they can feed on their favorite corals just as much as they normally would, actually. And then the food quality. As I said, those corals are down there, but they don't have as much light energy, so maybe they can't give as much food to the corals. And so the way that we test that is we sample the coral tissue, take some of the fats out of it, and see how much energy they're giving to the fish. And actually, we found that they can give just as much nutrition to the fish on the deep reefs as they can on the shallow reefs. And that's because the corals themselves are doing something that's quite clever. So in the shallow environment, they get most of their energy from the sunlight, you know, from the algae that lives in their tissue. But as I said, they can also feed, because they're kind of like upside down jellyfish, from plankton coming through the water column or other bits of food. So they actually increase the amount of food that they take from the water column on those deeper reefs, and they transfer that energy onto the fish. And so it means that these fish on those deep reefs have uh, actually equal body condition, so they're the same size, same weight, same energy production as on the shallow reefs. And so that's really good because these fish are in great condition, and so therefore they might be able to um, provide refuge populations if you have um, if you have uh, cases where you lose the shallow coral reefs but not the deep, the deep corals. And so we were looking to see if we could capture whether this happens. So it's no good just having healthy fish on the deep reefs if you actually don't have disturbances that only take out the shallow coral reefs and leave the deep reefs, then it's no good. But because we followed these fish for so long, we're actually able to capture a disturbance event. And does anyone know what this is? Crown of thorn starfish, yeah. So crown of thorn starfish are really big, ugly creatures on the reef, right? So they grow up to a, a meter big, actually, that's probably almost life size um, there. And what they do is they actually feed on corals. So they kind of compete with these fish for those coral resources. They go over top of the coral, they push their stomachs out, wrap it around the coral, even though it's a branching coral. They digest all of the coral tissue suck up the nutrients, suck it back up into themselves, and move on. So in between being in this site in year one and, year, and when we went back in year two, a crown of thorns outbreak happened, and they went through and actually ate almost all of the corals in the shallowest 10 meters. And probably because the corals went so close together down in the deeper depths, they actually left the deeper depths. And so this is a great natural experiment for us to see if there's a refuge there. So when we went back in the second year, this is what it looked like. There was almost no corals and no fish in the shallowest 10 meters. But below 10 meters, at kind of between 20 and 40 meters, there was actually more fish than we saw previously. And so it looks like, in this case, there was a potential for refuge for this butterfly fish on these reefs. And so that's great, because that means that there could be better survival opportunities for reef fish going into the future on deep reef environments, yeah? So I'm just going to pause there really quickly and ask if there's any questions before I move on to the more interesting and exciting part about <laughs> what's down on these really deep reef environments. Yes? Yes. 
Yeah, we, yeah, haven't, we haven't done, done that, that so much, much, but more what we have started to do is look at um, historic sea level rises, right? So we know around Sabre, um, the island, there's a lot of drop-offs just, uh, just off the island where the sea level used to be, you know, between 30 and 60 metres lower than it is now at different periods in history. And so we more are looking at sea level in that aspect to see how past sea level might have created how much habitat is available for coral reefs in different environments and whether the past sea level habitat um, has an influence on modern fish distributions. Yeah, but that's a really interesting question. It'd be good to do that. Yes. Yeah, so, oh yeah, sorry, I didn't, didn't repeat the questions. So the question was, uh, the first question was ask, asking about sea level, which you might have picked up. Uh, the, the second question was asking about whether crown of thorns are a man-made problem, uh, because they're naturally part of the environment, and have they just increased because of human uh, disturbance or intervention? And the, um, there was, they definitely are um, natural in the environments, and there seems to be huge sweeps. So there'll be just one or two crown of thorns around in the environment, and then every 10 years or so, you'll just get uh, hundreds of thousands of them come through. And they'll be in big lines, and they'll eat out an entire coral reef and march on. And there used to, the, about five years ago, there was um, a thought that it was because of increased nutrient runoff um, from, say, farming, doing sugarcane or banana farming on the coast, and those nutrients coming out of the rivers, feeding the baby um, crown of thorn starfish, and then the increased success of those babies means that you get these outbreaks. But we're actually not too sure if that's the case anymore. But what's really crazy is that those, um, those crown of thorns, the females lay or make lay 10 million eggs, each large female. And so even a tiny, tiny percentage in the increase of survival of those babies, that's when you get these huge outbreaks coming through. That's a really interesting question. Thanks for that. Yeah, so they think uh, that the Triton shellfish was a natural predator of it, and that perhaps um, they were fished out 20 or 30 years ago to populations that couldn't control it anymore. And again, we don't really have, it's a, a, th a theory at the moment, and we don't have strong evidence to, to back that up, but it's one of the leading theories. Um, and what we are starting to see is that there's more and more fish, uh, kind of like lionfish actually, there's more and more fish starting to feed on crown of thorns now that they're becoming a big problem again. So they're kind of hoping that fish might help to, to keep them in check. Yeah, really nice questions about, about the crown of thorns, thanks. Cool, so I'll move on. So um, this lower mesophotic environment, it's kind of like from 60 to 130, 150 meters, it's really hard to get to. You can't use normal scuba to get to these environments. I'm just gonna have to go over to this side again, sorry, the clicker works, doesn't work. And so what you're looking at here is some divers wearing way too much equipment. They just look ridiculous, right? <laughs> Absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, look at what they're wearing, it's like, five tanks, things strapped on their backs, scooters, things hanging off them all over the place, and there's no bubbles, right? So what they're using is closed circuit rebreathers, and so we can use that to safely dive to these depths of up to 150 meters as scientists and record the fish life that that's down there. And so what happens is when you breathe out, instead of the gas leaving and going up into the water column, the carbon dioxide goes through a carbon scrubber on your back takes out the carbon but leaves the oxygen and keeps the oxygen rotating around. And then a computer puts a couple of other gases of choice into your breathing system and you don't use much gas. So you can spend, go down really deep and spend a long time down there. So the team dives to 150 meters. And just to put that into perspective, because I know some of you work in feet, here's a, here's a picture on the side. Um, this is a scale from zero to 150 meters in the white. I'll just duck down. And I'm just going to shrink that diver down to natural size. And you can kind of see how far down that actually is. So it's a long way to swim down to get to 150 meters on the reef. And when you're down there, you only spend about five minutes there before you have to return to come up. And that's because if you're spending five minutes down at 150 meters, 
it takes up to five hours to return to the surface safely. That's your decompression stop, right? So these are really long dives. This takes the entire day, yeah? But it's really worth it because these environments aren't explored very much. We find a lot of new species of fish, yeah? So these are some of the fish that the groups uh, found in, in the last couple of years. And actually, if we look at the places that uh, the team's been to between 2002 and 2017, haven't actually updated it, so there's like Fiji, Vanuatu, Philippines, Ponape, Easter Island, and if you look at the number of new species that have been found in those places on these dives, so these are each individual expeditions, and you see we found a lot of new species early on, but as we get later on, we're not finding so many species because we're exploring the environment a bit more. But if you look at the amount of time that we spend below 100 meters, and you do the ratio, we're actually finding about five species per hour, or one, spe one species every 10 minutes of exploring these environments. So it's really amazing. And a couple of the, oh, we just recently did a trip to the Maldives um, in January, and first of all, you can see how diverse our team is and how big it is to support this kind of diving, and we work a lot with, uh, in this particular case, with uh, the local Maldivian researchers, um, and in this 10-day dive trip, we found eight new species of fish because just no one explores those depths. And so this is one of those fish, and this actually was named by one of the Maldivian colleagues um, who helped find it. Um, and it's the first fish ever described by a Maldivian, even though they've lived in those island nation states for thousands of generations, probably. And it's called uh, Finifema um, in the local Maldivian language, which means uh, beautiful rose. And so it's the Rose Ferry Rass. And the one that we found previous to that actually got pretty famous in the media. It was found in East Africa not long after the movie Black Panther came out. And it's got this beautiful purple color that reminded uh, the team of vibranium in that Black Panther movie. So it's called the Vibranium Ferry Rass. And its scientific name is Wakanda. <laughs> yeah? So a little shout out to that. So what we do with those five hours coming back up, though, is we have all this time to explore that entire depth gradient of coral reefs and see what's living there. And so these red dots on the map there are places that we've collected data from. And so every like 20 or 30 meters up that reef, we count how many fish are there and what types of fish are there. And so that means we can answer some really big questions. We also uh, record uh, information about the habitat itself. And so, one of the things that we've been able to do, what you're looking at here, is plastic trash on the reef below 100 meters, right? Where almost no humans have ever been. So what we're able to do is we're able to join up with colleagues from Australia, from East Africa, and from Oxford University in England to see how widespread this is. And so what you're looking at here is each circle is a place that we surveyed with these teams here, and the size of the circle is how much trash there is in one kilometer squared. And you can see some locations have more than others. But what I want you to look at is that the dark blue is mesophotic reefs, so below 30 meters, and the light blue is shallow reefs above 30 meters. And so for more, more than half of the locations that we surveyed, there's more trash on mesophotic reefs than there is on, coral, on shallow coral reefs. And so even though there might be increased opportunities for, for fish and life down there in the future, they're definitely not untouched environments. And actually, a lot of this um, trash came from, you're looking at the light pink here in these circles, is fishing gear. So a lot of it comes from fishing gear that's left over. And in the dark purple, you can see in a couple of places like East Africa and the Philippines where the populations are a bit higher, there's a lot of consumer plastics. So plastic bags, plastic drink, drinking bottles, takeaway cups, chippy packages, things like that. But getting back to the fish, and this is the last thing that I'm kind of looking at today, is one of the other big scale um, things that we've been able to look at with this data set is whether the patterns that we see in shallow coral reefs also occur in deep coral reefs. So what you're looking at here is the red triangle is what we call the coral triangle. So it covers northern Australia, Papua New Guinea, Indonesia, Philippines, more or less. And there's more fish there and more corals there than anywhere else in the world. So that's what those red dots there. Those red dots are showing you that there's about 600 species of fish in those coral reefs. And as you move to the east or to the west of that area, you get fewer and fewer species of fish. Um, but the problem is, is that 
most of this research occurs only with shallow water data, more or less. So it doesn't incorporate depth that much. So what we wanted to do is see whether the same pattern occurs on deep coral reefs. And so this is data from, from our surveys, and you can see the coral triangle there, and you can see that pattern's pretty much there, right? As you move further away from the coral triangle towards the Caribbean and to, into the um, Atlantic, um, you get fewer and fewer fish. But as you go down to the upper mesophotic reef, that pattern's still there a little bit, but it's kind of not as strong. And by the time you get to the, the lower mesophotic reef, that pattern's not there at all. So what this means is that if you're looking in the shallow reef environments and you're comparing Philippines to you're going to get a lot more fish species in the Philippines than in Saba. But if you're on the deep reefs, you're actually going to get a very similar number of species. And so that means that there could be entirely different processes or like environmental controls um, um, informing what kind of fish can live in shallow and deep reefs in these different places. And that's really interesting. And so this is the last little bit that I'm going to show you. So bear with me. This is a, a, a graph of uh, the diversity of fish species in the Pacific and the diversity of fish species in the Atlantic. And here you're talking about zero meters, and here you're talking about 130 meters on each of them. And each of the colors is a different family of fish, right? You can see most of those colors are decreasing really rapidly as you get deeper on the reef, right? as you move from left to right to the graphs. And these are the kind of families like the surgeon fishes, the damsel fishes, the parrot fishes, and the wrasses. So most of those are all decreasing on the reef, but you can see those dark blue bars. They're actually increasing in both the Pacific and in the Atlantic. And so this is a group called the Ceranids, and it's kind of um, your, your um, Antheas and your groupers and things like that, and you can kind of see that they have these beautiful colors in common. And so there's something about these fish that make them really successful on these deep mesophotic reefs, whereas the other ones don't. It kind of makes a little bit of sense, right? So our parrot fish eats algae, yeah? Our surgeon fish eats algae, and of course there's not much light on these deep coral reefs, so you don't expect many fish that eat algae on these coral reefs. And what these uh, types of fish at the top here do really well is that they either eat plankton and so the plankton is all throughout the water column and they can access that so they're not necessarily really closely associated to the reef or they're fish that eat other fish and so if you're a fish that eats other fish you can just eat whatever fish is there and so these are the groups that are really successful on, on uh, the, the mesophotic coral reefs and we're looking into this more and more to try and understand why that uh, gradient in the number of fish species isn't there on the lower reefs. Um, and also um, starting to look at kind of the stuff that I showed you earlier on, kind of what are more individual fish doing and where they're getting the energy from and things like that, what's limiting different species from being down on those deep reefs. So the take-home points from my talk um, are that changing environments threaten many ecosystems, and coral reefs are one of those for sure. The way that fish lives work changes along a depth gradient. Mesophotic coral reefs are really poorly understood and have many unique components. And understanding or having a better understanding of how life works on these deep reefs will help us better protect and help these unique environments going into the future. And one of the things that's important for that actually is when you have marine protected areas, for example, I think the one in Saba, it stops at 50 meters. And so even though there's this equal abundance of fish in the deeper reefs compared to the Philippines, and there might be these unique fish communities to protect, the marine, marine protected areas don't necessarily actually go that deep. All right, and um, thanks for listening. And I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah. Oh yeah, so there's a couple of couple of thermoclines. So the question is, what sort of temperatures are you looking at at those really deep depths? And so we dive in the tropics most often. So I work in Celsius. Are, you gonna, are we going to be able to do this? You're Canadian? All right, we can do this. Yeah, so quite, often, so quite often it's like 27 to 29 degrees Celsius at the surface, and you get to about 60 meters, and then it drops off really quickly um, to about maybe 19 degrees. And actually, this is where we see the biggest change in fish communities, is when that temperature drops all of a sudden, 
and there's this thermolay. And then quite often when you get down even deeper, say about 100 meters or 120 meters, it will drop again and sometimes get as low as 12 degrees. So the divers will actually start shivering because you've got to spend five hours in 27 degrees decompressing, but you're spending 10 minutes at 12 degrees and you're just like going to get up like this. Yeah, yeah, really great question. Yeah. Ah, uh, yes, in the black. Yeah, that's a really good question. So, like, there's no light down. Oh, so the question is, is um, the colors of the fish don't seem to change that much as you move into those deeper depths, and why is it that they seem to be as vibrant? Um, in the deeper depths. And of course, there's not much light on those lower mesophotic reefs, so why do they put so much energy into having these beautiful colours? Um, so one of the things is that the colours on those deep reefs are actually all quite similar. So they're usually yellows, oranges and purples. So in the shallow reefs, you get much more diverse colours, and on those deeper reefs, they kind of keep those, but they are very vibrant. And it might be the case that um, the eyes of the fish are working differently and picking up um, dif different signals than we are, um, but we actually haven't really looked into that. Yeah, that's a really great question. Yeah. Um, have you considered using submersibles or is the yeah. prohibitive? Yeah, okay, so the question is have we considered using submersibles or is the cost prohibitive? And actually we do use things like remote underwater robots that are kind of remote controlled, and we do use submersibles a little bit. But the thing is, is that they're not very agile, particularly the submersibles, right? So you can go down and see what's there, and sometimes you have attachments that can actually suck fish into a catch bag if you want to do that. So we do that with lionfish, for example. Um, you were asking before the talk how deep do lionfish go. You can see lionfish in Curacao down to beyond 200 meters. And we actually, some of my colleagues take submarines down there, and they suck them into a catch bag in the, so we can see what they're feeding and what they're eating and things like that. And then with the remote underwater vehicles, they're a bit smaller and a bit more mobile, and you can see what's there, but you still kind of like look around and you don't have that same knowledge and dexterity that a diver has. Yeah, but we do use that a lot because it's a lot safer. Yeah. Yeah, question. How do you bring the fish up when we catch them? How do we bring the fish up when we catch them? So I've been working with the California Academy of Sciences, and they have an aquarium, and they actually have a mesophotic... Uh, exhibit in that aquaria where we have some of these fish uh, on display and millions of people see them every year. And so fish have swim bladders, right? So they have a little balloon of air that stops them from sinking. And so if you bring that up too fast, just like a diver, that gas expands and this, they pop, basically, and, and you kill the fish. So one of the way that, that uh, scientists used to deal with this and aquarium collectors used to deal with this is you can put a needle in and pop that swim bladder and bring it up and then it heals over time but it, there's a risk of bringing an infection there so what the team came up with at the California Academy of Sciences is they made an in-water decompression recompression chamber for fish so you catch the fish at 150 meters you put it inside an interior chamber you fill it with water put a little air bubble in there so there's some pressure seal it in an external chamber put a little dive computer on it with a couple of pumps, you can bring it up to the surface, it's at that same pressure as where you caught it, and then you can slowly decrease the pressure over two or three uh, days, or as long as it takes. And that way, we can keep the fish that's, uh, for you know, like two or three years in the aquaria. Uh, the pressure's not so much an issue, you just have to keep the light down, um, so it's not too bright for them, and you can just feed them a pretty normal diet. That's a really great question, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm hoping that you're all closed circuit rebreather divers because I bought 10 of them with me. <laughs> no, um, we probably won't go that deep, right? So I, I don't know whether people are going to be on air or on nitrox. That'll be up to the people who join us. And what we'll probably do is we'll probably do a comparison between, say, 25 meters and two meters. And that kind of last graph that I showed you of the different colors and the different families of fish, we'll kind of be doing that. We'll be looking to see what different families are more abundant in those shallow and deeper depths, and also how some of the forms of those change. So how does some of the shape of those fish change? Yeah.
Cool. Any other questions? Or should we wrap it up? Great. Thanks for coming out. <laughs>